Hi, this is Dr. Joe Angley. Welcome to this short lecture video. This lecture video introduces you to some of the thought leaders that have shaped our views of the environment. Many of our current views of the environment are rooted in the writings of relatively recent environmental thinkers. In general, their work can be grouped into four stages. Resource conservation for optimal use, nature preservation for moral and aesthetic reasons, concern over health and ecological consequences of pollution, and fourth, global and environmental citizenship. These stages are not mutually exclusive. However, human misuse of the nature of nature is not unique to modern times. Plato complained of environmental degradation in ancient Greece in 500 BC. The use of mountainsides for grazing and cutting of trees for lumber and shipbuilding caused extensive erosion and environmental damage. 18th century French and British colonial administrators observed and understood the connections between deforestation, soil erosion, and local climate change. French administrators in Mauritius set aside reserves to better ensure protection of natural resources under their care. As you can see in this photo, even your family dog knows that deforestation is bad for the environment and bad for people. A country right here in the Western Hemisphere shows the devastating consequences and exploitation of natural resources causes. The country of Haiti is an excellent example of this. Deforestation in Haiti is a severe environmental problem. In 1923, over 60% of Haiti's land was forested. By 2006, less than 2% of the land was forested. The rapid deforestation of Haiti began during colonial period and was intensified when coffee was introduced in 1730. Upland forests were cleared and 50 years later, a quarter of the colony's land was under coffee. The system of plantation monoculture and clean cultivation between rows of coffee, indigo, tobacco, and sugarcane exhausted soil nutrients and led to rapid soil erosion. Following the Revolution of 1804, the government was forced to cut and export timber throughout the 19th century to pay off a 90 million franc debt to France. No longer under colonial rule, land remained unequally distributed nevertheless and peasants were granted access only to marginal slopes between 200 and 600 meters above the fertile plains and below the zones of coffee production. This forced peasants to farm on the slopes and these hillside soils were particularly susceptible to erosion when cleared for farming. Add to this a huge demand for wood-based charcoal in the 20th century, and the result is massive deforestation and erosion. In contrast, the Dominican Republic had a history of forest conservation and limited destructive logging and agricultural activities. To some extent, the United States has avoided large-scale ecological damage like that we see in Haiti. Many historians consider the publication of Man and Nature in 1864 by geographer George Perkins Marsh as the wellspring of environmental protection in North America. Marsh, who was also a lawyer, politician, and diplomat, traveled widely around the Mediterranean as part of his diplomatic duties in Turkey and Italy. He read widely in the classics, including Plato, and personally observed the damage caused by excessive grazing by goats and sheep and by the deforestation of steep hillsides. Alarmed by the wanton destruction and profligate waste of resources still occurring in the American frontier during his lifetime, he warned of its ecological consequences. Largely because of his book, National Forest Reserves were established in the United States in 1873, to protect dwindling timber supplies and endangered watersheds. Deforestation in the U.S. was a serious problem. Marsh was from Vermont. For instance, by 1849, nearly 80% of the forests in Vermont had been cleared for agriculture, primarily sheep farming. Marsh showed that changes in the microclimates, waterways, and wildlife populations directly resulted from the clearing of forest land. At a time when Vermont's agricultural economy was in serious decline, Marsh urged state and local agricultural agencies to direct reforestation efforts whenever possible in order to offset environmental damage already done. Wanton slaughter of wildlife was also pervasive in the United States during Marsh's lifetime. During the 18th century, many species, including the bison, were nearly wiped out. 
Conservation efforts have since helped to restore populations, though not to previous levels. Influenced by Marsh, Roosevelt and his chief forester, Gifford Pinchot, developed a conservation ethic called pragmatic utilitarian conservation. In short, they argued that forests would be saved not to preserve nature per se, but to provide raw materials. As the first college-educated forestry major, Pinchot designed and implemented natural resource management based on scientific principles. The basis of Roosevelt and Pinchot's policies was pragmatic utilitarian conservation. They argued that forests should be saved not because they are beautiful or because they shelter wild creatures of the wilderness, but only to provide homes and jobs for people. Resources should be used for the greatest good, for the greatest number, for the longest time. There has been a fundamental misconception, Pinchot wrote, that conservation means nothing but husbanding and resources for future generations. Nothing could be further from the truth. The first principle of conservation is development, and use of the natural resources now existing on this continent for the benefit of the people who live here now. There may be just as much waste in neglecting the development and use of certain natural resources as there is in their destruction. This pragmatic approach can still be seen in the multiple-use policies of the U.S. Forest Service. John Muir, amateur geologist, popular author, and first president of the Sierra Club, strenuously opposed Pinchot's utilitarian policies. Muir argued that nature deserves to exist for its own sake, regardless of its usefulness to us. Aesthetic and spiritual values form the core of his philosophy of nature protection. This outlook prioritizes preservation because it emphasizes the fundamental right of other organisms and nature as a whole to exist and to pursue their own interests. Muir wrote, The world, we are told, was made for man, a presumption that is totally unsupported by the facts. Nature's object in making animals and plants might possibly be, first of all, the happiness of each one of them. Why ought man to value himself as more than an infinitely small unit of the one great unit of creation. This attitude of preservation of nature for its own sake is seen today in the philosophy and operating rules of the National Park Service. In 1935, pioneering wildlife ecologist Aldo Leopold bought a small worn-out farm in central Wisconsin. A dilapidated chicken shack, the only remaining building, was remodeled into a rustic cabin. Working with his children, Leopold planted thousands of trees in a practical experiment in restoring the health and beauty of the land. Conservation, he wrote, is the positive exercise of skill and insight, not merely a negative exercise of abstinence or caution. The shack became a writing refuge and became the main focus of a Sand County Almanac, a much-beloved collection of essays about our relation with nature. In it, Leopold wrote, We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Together with Bob Marshall and two others, Leopold was a founder of the Wilderness Society. Prior to World War II, the population of the United States was largely rural. Following the war, the United States began huge de industrial development, continued migration to cities, and the development of suburbs, ushering in the age of the automobile and the interstate highway. Rising levels of population and incidents like the Great London Smog raised people's awareness of industrial pollution. Like London, England, air quality in the industrial cities of the United States was very poor, as was water quality. The photo on the right is of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Both photos were taken in the afternoon. In response to pollution from the chemical industries after World War II, Rachel Carson published a book, Silent Spring, in 1962. This book awakened the public to the threats of toxic chemicals to humans as well as to other species and launched the modern environmental movement. Rachel Louise Carson was an American marine biologist and conservationist whose book Silent Spring and other writings are credited with advancing the global environmental movement. Carson began her career as an aquatic biologist in the United States Bureau of Fisheries and became a full-time nature writer in the 1950s. 
Late in the 1950s, Carson turned her attention to conservation, especially some environmental problems that she believed were caused by synthetic pesticides. The result was the book Silent Spring, which brought environmental concerns to an unprecedented share of the American people. Although Silent Spring was met with fierce opposition by chemical companies, it spurred a reversal in nationwide pesticide policy, which led to a nationwide ban on DDT and other pesticides, and it inspired a grassroots environmental movement that led to the creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Carson was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Jimmy Carter. Barry Commoner was an American biologist, college professor, and politician. He was a leading ecologist and among the founders of the modern environmental movement. He ran for president of the United States in 1980 on the Citizens Party ticket. One of Commoner's lasting legacies is his Four Laws of Ecology as written in The Closing Circle in 1971. The four laws are, everything is connected to everything else. There is one ecosphere for all living organisms and what affects one affects all. 2. Everything must go somewhere. There is no waste in nature, and there is no a way to which things can be thrown. 3. Nature knows best. Humankind has fashioned technology to improve upon nature, but such change as a natural system is, says Commoner, likely to be detrimental to that system. 4. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Exploitation of nature will inevitably involve the conversion of resources from useful to useless forms. David Ross Bauer was a prominent environmentalist and the founder of many environmental organizations, including the John Muir Institute for Environmental Studies, Friends of the Earth, the League of Conservation Voters, Earth Island Institute, North Cascades Conservation Council, and Fate of the Earth Conferences. He served as executive director of the Sierra Club and served on its board three times. Some of today's leading environmental thinkers come from developing nations where poverty and environmental degradation together plague hundreds of millions of people. Dr. Wangari Madai of Kenya was a notable example. In 1977, Dr. Madai founded the Green Belt Movement in her native Kenya as a way to both organize poor rural women and restore their environment. Beginning at a small local scale, this organization has grown to more than 600 grassroots networks across Kenya. They have planted more than 30 million trees while mobilizing communities for self-determination, justice, equity, poverty reduction, and environmental conservation. Dr. Mandai was elected to the Kenyan parliament and served as assistant minister for the environment and natural resources. Her leadership has helped bring democracy and good government to her country. In 2004, she received the Nobel Prize for her work. In her acceptance speech, she said, Working together, we have proven that sustainable development is possible, that reforestation of degraded land is possible, and that exemplary governance is possible when ordinary citizens are informed, sensitized, mobilized, and involved in direct action for their environment.